Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip Emigwali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine. I'm Philip Emagwale, the world's fastest computing that's executed across up to a billion processors is the end product of the supercomputer in the technology that then US President Bill Clinton described as the Philip Emagwale formula for making computers faster. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the slowest processors could be used to solve the most difficult problems in science, engineering, and medicine, and used to find their answers at the fastest speeds. The fastest computer is used to foresee the weather before going outside. During my childhood in Nigeria, of early 1960s post-colonial Africa, I read of great minds of mathematics and physics. In early 1970s, I read about Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. In January 1960, and at age 5, I enrolled in St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, in the western region of the British West African colony of Nigeria. In 1960, the odd of me becoming the subject of school essays in the US, Canada, and UK was one in a billion. But after 30 years, I was studied with the icons of science, such as Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. Those school essays were recognitions I could not have imagined. In 1960, the word computer wasn't even in the vocabulary of a Nigerian. And the word supercomputer hasn't been coined. I began programming supercomputers on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, USA. At that time, there was no computer in Nigeria. And the war, in 1974, the word internet wasn't even in the vocabulary of, of an American computer scientist. My father's nursing career impacted my early development. That was the reason I grew up in Nigerian cities, such as Akure, Sapele, Burutu, Fokados, Uromi, Abo, Ibuzo, and Asaba. As a nurse in the western region of colonial and post-colonial Nigeria, my father was frequently transferred from one general hospital to the other. He worked on in each hospital for about two years, and in that short period, I could not learn the local language of our new community, such as the Yoruba language of Akure, the Ishikiri language of Sapele, the Ijo language of Burutu and Fokados, and the Isan language of Yuromi. I lived in Abo for three and a half years and then understood their Eka language. During the 30 month long Nigerian Civil War that ended on January 15, 1970, the Biafran government could not pay salaries and the refugees were unemployed and could not pay for the medical services they received. By the end of the war, the Biafran army had lost control of 80% of Biafra. And most Biafrans were refugees in Biafra. My father was a volunteer nurse in Biafran refugee camps. Papa was a volunteer nurse 
at the hospital in Oka Biafra from late September 1967 to January 19, 1968, and at the medical clinic in Oba Biafra from late January 1968 to March 21, 1968, and at the refugee camps in Okeetiti Biafra from March 29, 1968 to early July 1969 and was the only medical practitioner in the fishing community of Ndoni in Biafra from mid-July 1969 to January 19, 1970. Like every Nigerian, I spoke the grammatically simplified Nigerian pidgin language, which is compre incomprehensible to an American. Pidgin is used in informal conversations among friends and in markets and spoken as the ling second lingua franca across the 250 ethnic groups in Nigeria. I might say to a Nigerian lady, babe, you too fine, oh, this food sweet well well, you don't do. I'm fluent in my ancestral Igbo language. Igbo is an endangered language that's only spoken in the southeastern region of Nigeria. I use Google to translate any email sent to me in Igbo language. Biko, please speak slowly. I want to dance with you. Before the age of 12, I grew up in non Igbo speaking towns in Nigeria. However, we spoke Igbo at home. The southern boundary of Nigeria is a coastline that faces the Atlantic Ocean. When I was three and four years old, we lived in the Nigerian coastal towns of Burutu and Fokados, both in the Niger Delta in southern Nigeria. My family lived in Ijo speaking Fokados and did so for the two or three months before and after my fourth birth dates, date and presumably in the nurses' quarters of the Fokados General Hospital that employed my father as its relief duty staff nurse. In 1958, the year we lived in Fokados, it was a small coastal fishing community of fewer than a thousand persons in the Niger Delta of southern Nigeria. The Fokados General Hospital was built in 1890. It predated the Onitsha General Hospital by a decade. Some describe the Fokados General Hospital as the first modern hospital in West Africa. Five centuries earlier, Fokados was a major Portuguese slave trading port. Millions of Nigerian slaves were taken to the Portuguese colony of Brazil as domestic and plantation workers. For that reason, Brazil is the second most populous black country in the world and second only to Nigeria. The Fokados Slave Dungeon was built in 1475. The Fokados Slave Wharf is one of the longest in Africa. For four centuries, millions of slaves landed on the Fokados Wharf to begin their long journey to the Americas and across the Atlantic Ocean. The four centuries of non-stop slave trading in Fokados is to Nigeria what the atomic bombing of Hiroshima is to Japan and the Auschwitz concentration camp is to the Jewish people. For those reasons, the Fokados Slave Wharf should be listed as a United Nations World Heritage Site. Fokados is where Nigeria began. Fokados was the 15th century's administrative capital of the geographical area we now call Nigeria. Fokados was the Abuja of the 15th century Nigeria. 
My older sister, Onyari Florence, was born in Focados in 1958. The nine children of my mother had university education and became Nigerian Americans. The first school in Igbo land was founded on November 15, 1858. That school was a short stroll from the birthplace of my father and great-grandfathers and was also located a short stroll from the present location of General Hospital, Odicha. That was the first hospital in Igbo land. In 1857, that general hospital wasn't built. My great-grandfather, whose first name was Emma Agwale, was born and raised where the general hospital is now located. Forty years later, and at the end of the 19th century, the British colonial administrators decided to build the present General Hospital of our nature, citing eminent domain law that gives the government the power to take over any land and convert it to public use. The Emma Aguale family was ordered to move and relocate a walking distance away to 17 Bar Road on nature. Our proximity to that first school in Igbo land gave us several generations of Ndionicha, an unfair educational advantage over heartland Igbo-speaking people. Being among the first Nigerians to learn how to read and write meant that Ndionicha emigrated earliest and did so from Igbo land to the farthest regions of Nigeria. That was the reason Nandi Azikiwe, the first president of Nigeria, whose parents were born in Onicha, was born in 1904 in Zungiru, the capital of the British Protectorate of Northern Nigeria. It was the reason my granduncles emigrated from Onicha to Faraway Kano to work as clerks, and why my father emigrated from Onicha to Kano in 1948 and to Akure in 1950. Papa was trained and employed in General Hospital Akure as a 29-year-old junior staff nurse. By age 9, I had lived at a dozen Nigerian addresses in seven towns. The first was at 11 Ekemeso Street, Akure, West Western Region, Colonial Nigeria. My father was employed as a nurse in the General Hospital of Akure and from 1950 to early 1956. From the General Hospital Akure, Papa was transferred to Central Hospital, Sapele, Western Region. At first, we lived in the house headquarters of Sapele in 1956. That was where my immediate younger brother, Ndu Agoba Francis, was born in May 1956. In early 1958, my father was transferred from the General Hospital Sapele on what was called a six-month relief duty to the coastal towns of Burutu and Fokadus. My family of five spent most of the year 1958 in the latter two towns. In April 1958, we left Burutu to come back to Onicha to attend the funeral of my maternal grandfather, Chieka Balongu. Chieka was a farmer who lived his entire life at 6 C Wilkinson Road, Onicha. Chieka died after a long period of protracted illness that was related to diabetes. A group portrait in our family photo album, taken in April 1958, had my then 19-year-old mother, who was expecting her, expecting her third child. Sitting beside her, we are three female friends from our nature. All four women were elegantly dressed, but sat on a beautiful mat that was placed on the wooden stairways of our house in Burutu. The four women were Inyama Agata Emma Agwale, Mebel Ifejika, Clara Chude, and Modupe 
We lived in Burutu for six months, from early to mid-1958. As a three-year-old, I remember living in Burutu, in that one-story wooden house that was built upon support stills. Our house was elevated to protect us from daily tidal floods and occasional storms. We lived in Fakados for six months, from mid to late 1958. We lived in the nurses' waters of the General Hospital Fakados that was a short stroll from the community's post office. My sister, Onyare Florence, was born in 1958 in the General Hospital Fakados, and my sister, Chinwe Edith, was born in 1960 in the Central Hospital, Sapele. After my father returned from his six-month relief duty in Fokadus, we lived in the compound that was next to the Ego Club, Yoruba Road, Sapele. We lived besides the Ego Club from early 1959 to late April 1962. The Ego Club was established by actor Edward Prest, who later became the Nigerian ambassador to the United Kingdom. The Ego Club was sold in the early 1940s to a Lebanese. The manager of the Ego Club was Dixon McGray. The resident musician was Sally Young. The Ego Club was the dancing place in Sapele. When we hear the visiting musicians rehearsing, I and other children will sneak inside the Ego Club and enjoy a free live rehearsal concert. I enjoyed Victor Laya rehearsing his hit song, Aigana, and enjoyed Hobart, Hobart Udemba and his African baby vocal party rehearsing their hit song, Bottom Belle, that went like this. Bonswe asiki we, bonswe ayo ayo, bonswe asiki we, bonswe ayo ayo. As a four year old, I played along the dusty Yoruba Road and in front of the Ego Club. And I remember Festus Okotiobo, a man of means and the most flamboyant politician in Nigeria, in his chauffeur driven limo car, long driven long limo, limo, to draw the attention of us children carelessly playing on Yoruba Road. Okotiobo's chauffeur blasted his car's loud signature horn. By the mid-1960s, the Ego Club was demolished and Okotiobo bought a portion of the land it was built upon. Okotiobo built his Orogun Villa on that land, which is now 149 Yoruba Road, Sapele. In 1959, some of the band members at the Ego Club will give me a penny to buy two sticks of cigarettes for them and bring back their change of half a penny. That was the purchasing power of a penny between early 1959 and April 1962. From late April 1962 to November 1963, we lived next to Premier Club and Hotel Uromi that was the town's prostitutes compound. The most memorable event that occurred when we lived when, when, we lived, when we lived near Premier Club at Abo, was that the renowned boxer Dick Tiger defeated Jim Fulmer on August 10, 1963, in Liberty Stadium, Ibadan, Nigeria. Tiger defeated Fulmer to retain his world middleweight boxing title. The Premier Club was downstairs of a two story building that was owned by an Igbo man named Oba. The Premier Club was the dancing place in the Uromi of the early 1960s. From our adjacent compound, we hear the visiting musicians rehearsing. I and other children will immediately sneak inside the Premier Club and enjoy a free live rehearsal concert. I enjoyed Zil Onya rehearsing his hit songs, Vicky Nyama Abu Afun and Opigwe. In a concert at the Premier Club of 1963, 
Emmanuel Ntia and his Eastern Stars Dance Band of Nigeria rocked its dance hall with their ex rated number one high life hit song called Color Chop. Like other Igbo children in Urobi of 1962, we learned the sensational Eastern acrobatic cultural dance of the spirits. From mid-December mid 1963 to late 1966, we lived along Bonoba Road, Abo, Midwest region, Nigeria, and in a three-bedroom house about a block downhill and on the left from the house of Jerete Marere, the first governor of the Midwest region of Nigeria. My elementary school education consisted of two years at St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, two years at St. Anthony's Primary School, Urumi, and two years at St. John's Primary School, Abo. The names of the first two schools have changed. The St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, that I attended shared premises with the town's then only Catholic Church. The St. Anthony's Primary School, Uromi, that I attended was across the street from the town's then only Catholic Church. I enrolled in classes three and four at St. Anthony's from late April 1962 to mid-December 1963. After earning my first school living certificate in December 1965, Following two years at St. John's Primary School, Abo, Midwest Region, Nigeria, I enrolled for 15 months at St. George's College, Obinomba, Midwest Region, Nigeria. Like, 90%, like 99% of the children in Biafra, I dropped out of school for three years during ages 12 to 15. I dropped out to live in refugee camps of Biafra of the Nigerian Civil War. But I also dropped out again for two years from Christ the King College of Nature in March 1972 and after the Civil War was over. One in 15 Biafrans died during that 30 month long war. In the list of the genocidal crimes of the 20th century, Committed against humanity, the death of one in 15 Biafrans was ranked fifth. I'm the subject of school essays on computer inventors because I was in the news and because I contributed to the development of the world's fastest computers. Specifically, I discovered how to compress the time to solution of the most compute intensive scientific problems described as the 20 hardest problems that can be solved on extremely fast supercomputers. Likewise, I'm the subject of school essays on physicists and their discoveries because I was in the news for discovering how to compress the time to solution of the most compute intensive problems arising from encoding the laws of physics and encoding those laws into the partial differential equation of calculus. Likewise, I'm in school essays on mathematicians and their contributions to mathematics because I was in the news for mathematically discovering how to reduce an initial boundary value problem of calculus defined in its interior domain by a, by a system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional partial differential equations. I discretize those equations to reduce them to a large scale system of equations of computational linear algebra that approximated the governing initial boundary value problem. I'm in school essays on mathematicians who contributed to mathematics because I was in the news 
for mathematically discovering how to solve those algebraic equations and solve them to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming and solve them to recover otherwise unrecoverable crude oil and natural gas buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep. I'm in school essays on physicists who contributed to physics because I was in the news for experimentally discovering how to make the most compute intensive problems in physics and that are impossible to solve, possible to solve. I'm in school essays on scientists and their discoveries because I was in the news for discovering how to solve the most challenging problems in science called grand challenges and how to solve them across the slowest processes in the world and solve them at the fastest possible speeds in the world. Once upon a time, before the 4th of July 1989 to be exact, the fastest 1,000 computers in the world computed with only one custom manufactured and super fast vector processor. Before the 4th of July 1989, parallel supercomputing or attaining the fastest speeds across the slowest processors was mocked and ridiculed as science fiction and was dismissed as a beautiful theory that required experimental confirmation. On the 4th of July 1989, and in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I confirmed parallel supercomputing to be faster than the fastest sequential supercomputing. That contribution to computer science is the reason I won an award in 1989 that is referred to as the Nobel Prize of Supercomputing. My milestone in the history of the computer was marked as the first time the fastest speed in supercomputing was recorded across the slowest processors in the world. A year later, on June 20, 1990, the Wall Street Journal and other media wrote that Philip M. Aguale has experimentally discovered that parallel processing many problems at once instead of sequentially processing one problem at a time should be the starting point of the next generation of supercomputers 1989 was the year that I discovered how to parallel process across a spherical island of identical and coupled processors that shared nothing. My new technology was a new internet in reality and not a computer by its very nature. 1990 was the year the supercomputing industry upgraded parallel processing from a theory to a discovery and from science fiction novels to non-fiction computer science textbooks. I was in the news because I discovered a quantum shift or a significant change in the way we look at both the computer and the supercomputer. After the 4th of July, 1989, the fastest 1,000 computers in the world were computing in parallel and communicating across up to 10,649,600 processors. We now have a more profound and sure understanding of why and how the world's fastest computer Parallel processes. Massively parallel processing 
was the stone that was rejected as rough and unsightly, but that became the headstone of the supercomputer industry. According to the guiding lights of the world of computing of the 1970s and 80s, namely Gene Amdahl of the IBM world of mainframe computing of the 1960s, Seymour Cray of the world of vector computing of the 1980s, and Steve Jobs of the world of personal computing of the, of the 1990s. And according to these three giants, it would forever remain impossible to use eight or more processors to achieve a speed up of eightfold. In the spirit of the 1970s and 80s, the June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World magazine carried an article titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Questioned as Waste of Time. Unquote. Fourteen years after that article, the June 1990 issue of the Siam News, the flagship by Motley News Journal of Mathematicians, carried a cover story that described how Philip Emmanuel Gwale mathematically and experimentally discovered how to save time by parallel supercomputing through 64 binary thousand processors. And the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal and several newspapers and magazines carried a story that reported that Philip M. Aguale discovered that parallel supercomputing is not an enormous waste of everybody's time. I contributed to the newer understanding of the supercomputer and my discovery changed the way we think of the supercomputer. In the bygone way of thinking, the supercomputer solved one problem at a time. In the contemporary way of thinking, the supercomputer solves many problems at once. My scientific discovery of the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors became computing's defining moment and the bedrock of the supercomputer. That scientific discovery of parallel supercomputing made the news headlines because I invented the fastest computer and invented the supercomputer technology across the slowest 65,536 processors in the world. On a relative scale, the speed increase I discovered in 1989 was 3,000 times greater than the speed advantage the commercial aircraft has over the bicycle. The fastest supercomputer of today is 100 million times faster than the fastest supercomputer of 30 years ago. In 1989, it made the news headlines that I discovered how a large-scale computational physicist can compress her time to solution from 180 computing years to one supercomputing day. My scientific discovery opened the door to the state-of-the-art supercomputers used to compress time to solution from 30,000 years on a computer to one day on a supercomputer. Between April 18 to 20, 1967, an IBM supercomputer scientist named Gene Amdahl wrote it would forever be impossible to compress time to solution from eight days to one day and do so by parallel supercomputing the most compute intensive problems in the world. That pessimistic assertion that originated between April 18 to 20, 1967, and from the Spring Joint Computer Conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey, 
entered every supercomputer textbook to become the famed Anders Law. That Anders Law is to supercomputing across plural processors. What most law is to computing within a singular processor. On the date Anders Law was invented, I was fleeing as a 12-year-old refugee, fleeing from Abo, Nigeria, and fleeing to Onitsha, Biafra. Onitsha was my ancestral hometown. In the following 30 months, Onitsha became the bloodiest battlefield in African warfare. During that Nigerian civil war, one in 15 Biafrans died. 22 years after Amda's law was published, I discovered that the unimaginable to compute is possible to supercompute. I discovered how to exceed the eighth processor factor of eight speed up limit, known as Amda's law, and how to use 64 binary thousand processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in the world. My scientific discovery of the fastest computing made the new satellites as the biggest fundamental change in computer science. My scientific discovery opened the door to a revolution, namely computers and supercomputers that could solve many problems at once. The scientific discovery that I recorded during my email experiments of July 4, 1989, provided the designers of the supercomputer with the insight that massively parallel processing is useful. My new insight changed the way the first supercomputer that computes across fastest, across the slowest processors. The super look, the supercomputer of the 1980s and earlier was the size of your refrigerator. The supercomputer of today occupies the space of a soccer field, consumes as much electricity as a small American town, and costs as much as the budget of a small African nation. That change in the way the supercomputer looks and costs is my contribution to computer science. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the slowest processors could be used to solve the biggest problems and find their answers at the fastest speeds. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. From an early age in Nigeria, I studied the contributions of the great minds of science. I learned that Euclid is the father of geometry. Later, I learned that Albert Einstein is the father of modern physics. Becoming a father of a then unknown technology wasn't something I could have imagined during the, age, during the ages 12 to 15. In that period, I dropped out of school to live in refugee camps of Biafra, created by the Nigerian Civil War. For three years following May 1967, all schools in Biafra were closed, and one in 15 Biafrans died during that 30 month long war that ended on January 15, 1970. In the list of the worst genocidal crimes, of the 20th century, committed against humanity, the death of one in 15 Biafrans was ranked fifth. The quintessential questions of supercomputing were these. How do we compute faster? How do we do so by a billion fold? And what makes the supercomputer, super. My contribution to supercomputing is this. I discovered how to compress the time to solution. 
of the most compute intensive problems. Once upon a time, before the 4th of July, 1989, to be exact, the fastest 1,000 supercomputers in the world computed with only one custom manufactured super fast vector processor. Before the 4th of July, 1989, parallel supercomputing was mocked and ridiculed as a beautiful theory that lacked experimental confirmation. On the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I discovered practical parallel supercomputing and discovered the technology by harnessing the slowest processors in the world and using them to solve the most compute intensive problems in the world and solve those problems at the fastest speeds in the world. That invention was newsworthy because I discovered a paradigm shift of tectonic proportions that was a huge change in the way we look at the computer and the supercomputer. Parallel supercomputing was the stone rejected as rough and unsightly, but that became the, mild, the milestone and the headstone of the supercomputer industry. I was in the news because I contributed to the understanding of the world's fastest computers. My discovery changed the way we think of the supercomputer. In the customary way of computing, the supercomputer solved one problem at a time. In my new way of computing, the supercomputer solves up to a billion problems at once. My scientific discovery of parallel supercomputing became computing's defining moment and the bedrock of the supercomputer. My scientific discovery opened the door to a revolution, namely computers and supercomputers that could solve many problems at once. This discovery is my contribution to the supercomputer as it's known today that could become the computer of tomorrow. Massively parallel computing is the vital technology that enabled the supercomputer to tower over the computer that's not parallel processing. In 1989, I was in the news for inventing how to solve the most compute intensive mathematical problems that arise as the partial differential equations of calculus. I was in the news for inventing how to solve the largest system of equations that occur in computational linear algebra that approximated the system of partial differential equations that governs planetary scale fluid dynamics motions. The poster boy of such grand challenge problems is the supercomputer simulations of long-term global warming. After July 4, 1989, I was in the news for inventing how to solve the companion initial boundary value problems and how to solve them at the fastest speeds and solve them across a new internet. I visualized that new internet as my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. I visualized those processors as coupled, identical, equal distances apart and sharing nothing. That new comp internet is a supercomputer in reality. That supercomputer is an instrument of mathematics and physics. The fastest supercomputer is the flagship computer of the world. My contributions to mathematics were these. I discovered how to solve nonlinear partial differential equations and how to solve them across a new internet that's a new global network of off-the-shelf processors.
that we are identical and coupled and that shared nothing, but we are in dialogue with each other. A complex system of nonlinear partial differential equations, or PDEs, is impossible to solve exactly and impossible to solve on the blackboard. However, the most important system of nonlinear partial differential equations can be solved approximately on the computer and solved with the most accuracy across a new internet that's a new global network of up to a billion off-the-shelf processors. In calculus textbooks, some linear partial differential equations can be solved exactly and solved by using the technique called Fourier series expansion and using it to solve an initial boundary value problem governed by the heat conduction e equation in one dimension. The heat equation is used to model the diffusion of particles. The heat equation is used to describe the macroscopic behavior of microscopic particles in Brownian motion or the random movement of fluid particles. That initial boundary value problem has directly or first type boundary conditions that specify the solution along the boundary of domain of the problem. In the 1980s, I used the exact solutions of linear partial differential equations to validate my parallel processed codes. Partial differential equations go by different names that depend on the assumptions and settings used to derive each. The coupled system of nine Philip M. Aguale partial differential equations is the mathematical language that I invented and used to describe the flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of an oil field. That's almost twice the size of Anambra, my state of origin in Nigeria. The nine Philip M. Aguali equations we are based on my corrected assumption that inertial forces exist within all producing oil fields. Philip M. Aguali equations are the most complicated equations in physics. My contributions to mathematics were these. I mathematically encoded the temporal and the convective inertial forces that exist within all producing oil fields. I encoded both physical forces into 36 partial derivative terms, and I added those mathematical terms to the existing 45 partial derivative terms described in computational physics textbooks on subsurface petroleum reservoir simulation. The grand challenge, initial boundary value problem of mathematics is so named because it requires tremendous supercomputer power to solve it with unacceptable accuracy. On my Eureka moment, which occurred at 15 minutes after 8 o'clock in the morning of the 4th of July 1989, I discovered how to parallel process 30,000 years of time to solution of a grand challenge problem to one day of time to solution across an ensemble of 10.65 million off-the-shelf processors. Although parallel processing entered the realm of science fiction and did so on February 1, 1922, it wasn't until my discovery, which occurred on July 4, 1989, that a full understanding of the vital technology that underpins the world's fastest computer was attained. In 1922, weather forecasting across 64,000 human computers was written as a science fiction story. My contributions to physics were these. 
on July 4, 1989, I discovered how to upgrade the science fiction of forecasting the weather across 64,000 human computers to the non-fiction of forecasting the weather across 64 binary thousand processors or across as many electronic computers. I contributed to physics by discovering how the extreme scaled climate model is parallel processed across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 processors and how global climate models can be executed by chopping up the model of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans into 65,536 smaller climate models that are mapped with a one model to one processor correspondence and mapped onto as many processors. The societal importance of my contribution to science is this. Parallel processed climate models are tools used by decision makers to help ensure the earth is safe for humans and for all animals. In 1989, it made the news when I discovered how to solve the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics and science, I was cover stories because I discovered how to solve the world's biggest problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science and solve them at the fastest recorded computer speeds. I invented how to solve the most compute-intensive mathematical problems called extreme-scale computational fluid dynamics and solve them across a new internet. That internet was a new global network of up to 1 billion identical and coupled processors. Each processor operated its operating system. Each processor was self-contained and had its dedicated memory and shared nothing. I was in the news because I invented a new internet that's a new global network of millions or billions of processors. I invented how to parallel process or how to execute a billion set of computer instructions and how to execute them at once or how to execute them in parallel and, and across up to a billion processors. For the 25-year-old mathematician, the expression partial differential equations of mathematical physics conjectures up images of the parabolic heat equation, the hyperbolic wave equation, and the elliptic and elliptic Laplace equation described in his mathematics textbooks. The real-world problems that arise in mathematical physics occur while and casting the weather up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of the earth. The world's biggest problems include the hand casting of the quote unquote weather deep inside the Niger Delta oil fields of southern Nigeria. Another large scale computational Fleet dynamics problem that's equally compute intensive is to forecast the long term weather above the surface of the earth. Or to simulate the spread of a once in a century global pandemic's contagious viruses across the two and a half billion passengers a year that ride in, Mo in Russia's Moscow metro. These real-world initial boundary value problems that are governed by partial differential equations of mathematical physics can't be analytically solved on the blackboard or solved with pencil and paper or solved with a computer that's powered by one processor. The world's most compute-intensive mathematical problems must be solved only across 
an ensemble of millions of processors that were identical and that shared nothing. As a research computational mathematician who came of age in the 1970s in Corvallis, Oregon, and 80s in College Park, Maryland, Washington, District of Columbia, and Los Alamos, New Mexico. My mathematical grand challenge was to invent the correct system of partial differential equations called the nine Philip M. Aguale equations that governs the flows of crude oil, natural gas, and ejected water that are flowing across any of the world's 65,000 producing oil fields, including Nigeria's 159 producing oil fields. My system of partial differential equations were not published in any calculus textbook of the 1980s. As their sole inventor, I was the first person to formulate and discretize them and consequently derive their companion system of partial difference equations of large-scale computational linear algebra. I invented both my systems of differential and difference equations from my correct formulation of the second law of motion of physics. I discovered how to chop up the most compute intensive problems as the 64 binary thousand high resolution computational physics codes that I must parallel process and that I must map in a one code to one processor corresponding fashion, and that I must evenly distribute onto as many of the shared processors that outline and define my new internet. My new internet was a virtual supercomputer in reality. That one code to one processor marking was the grand challenge of extreme scaled computational mathematics such as global climate modeling to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. What are the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to mathematics? Often scientific recognitions lack a sense of proportion and context. My mathematical discovery of 36 partial derivative terms that must be used to accurately pinpoint the seven mile, the miles deep locations of crude oil and natural gas deposits. It's abstract and it's not as important as my scientific discovery that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors. The later contribution was a scientific breakthrough and subject of newspaper articles and became the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer. Inventing my new 36 partial derivative terms requires very high level dense mathematics to explain all the mathematical steps that I took over a 15 year period. The simplified explanation of my mathematical invention that is my contribution to mathematical knowledge is that both the temporal and the convective inertial forces that exist in the actual problem must also exist on the blackboard and motherboard and must be represented by those 36 partial derivative terms. Inventing a new system of partial differential equations of calculus and discretizing those systems, those equations, into a new system of partial difference equations of large-scale computational linear algebra, and experimentally proving the stability and convergence properties of the companion partial difference algorithms, and coding those algorithms across a monumental, a monumental ensemble of off-the-shelf couple processors that shared nothing was a notable problem that was defined at the crossroad 
We are new physics, new mathematics, and the world's fastest computing intersected. In 1989, I was in the news for solving that grand challenge problem and for solving it alone. The parallel supercomputer that occupies the space of a soccer field is a supersized mathematical instrument that put the differential partial that put the partial differential equation back whence it, whence it came from. It's not enough to lecture on the mathematical foundation of the fastest supercomputers, even though that intellectual feat requires mastery of physics, mathematics, and computer science. It took me 20 years to arrive at the frontiers of knowledge of physics, mathematics, and supercomputing. I was in the news because I discovered how to solve the most compute-intensive mathematical problems, such as initial boundary value problems governed by a system of partial differential equations. I discovered how to solve partial differential equations across an ensemble of up to a billion processors. Such equations contextualized and encoded some of the most important laws of in physics. Such equations capture in a few succinct terms some of the most ubiquitous features of the air and water flowing across the surface of the earth, including the atmosphere and oceans, and the crude oil injected water and natural gas flowing across highly anisotropic and heterogeneous producing oil fields that are up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of the earth. An oil field is about the size of a town. My contributions to supercomputing, as it's executed today, push the boundaries of modern mathematical physics to include fastest computing across up to 1 billion processors. I couldn't have accidentally discovered a more accurately formulated system of partial differential equations and discovered it without knowing what's erroneous with the century-old partial differential equations that were published in textbooks. After 16 years of mathematical research, I became fearless in the face of the partial differential equations arising at the frontier of calculus. After 16 years, I developed the mathematical maturity that was needed to read the physics text subtext encoded into, the, into partial differential equations and needed to understand what their partial derivatives represent. I would introduce new partial derivatives and introduce them into the partial differential equations and where they were missing. After 16 years, I gained the ability to discretize any partial differential equation and to solve it on a computer or solve it across a new internet that's a new global network of coupled processors. I knew partial differential equations not by memorization, but through understanding them enough to invent new ones. I understood partial differential equations deeply. I could look in the mathematical physics textbook and see which key partial derivatives we are missing from the system of partial differential equations that were used by computational physicists and used to simulate the flows of crude oil, natural gas, and injected water that we are flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and flowing across a highly anisotropic and heterogeneous producing oil field that's up to twice the size of the state of Anambra, Nigeria. After 16 years, with foremost American and visiting European mathematicians, I developed the ability to translate verbal statements of the laws of physics and translate them into partial differential equations 
that arise beyond the frontier of calculus. Likewise, I developed the ability and the intuition that was needed to move back and forth between the laws of physics and the partial differential equations that arise beyond the frontier of calculus. Furthermore, I developed the mathematical maturity needed to identify connections between the weather above the surface of, of the earth and the weather below the surface of the earth. Not only that, I could spot century-old mathematical errors in textbooks and correct them. I could draw a line between the partial differential equations we know and the ones we don't know. How did I solve the most difficult problem in computational mathematics? I could use my instinct and intuition to solve initial boundary value problems in extreme scale mathematical physics. A calling for solving unsolved problems of mathematics is needed, just like it's impossible for you to set the world record in a 26.2 mile or 42 kilometer marathon race and do so without extensive training in long distance trail running. It would have been impossible for me to set the world record of the fastest mathematical computations that I executed on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and set that record without my 16-year-long training as a research computational mathematician in the USA. In 1989, what made the news headlines was that an African-born computational mathematician has discovered how to perform the fastest mathematical computations. I did so by changing the way we count, namely my alternative way of counting up to a billion things at once instead of the old way of counting, only one thing at a time. The old way of counting was used since the era of our prehistoric human ancestors. The paradigm shift from the sequential way of counting to the parallel way of counting is to the mathematics textbook what the continental drift was to the geology textbook. What are the importance of the Philip M. R. Gwale equations? To contribute new mathematics is to add new knowledge to the existing body of mathematical knowledge. The nine new partial differential equations that I invented were cover stories of top mathematics publications, such as the May 1990 issue of the Siam News, which is the flagship publication for the research mathematician. My partial differential equations are for discovering and recovering otherwise undiscoverable crude oil and natural gas formed up to 541 million years ago and buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep. Without the fastest computing across billions of processors that I discovered, the solution of the most compute-intensive initial boundary value problems such as the simulation of long-term climate change, will be as approximate as a sketch instead of as exact as a photograph. In theory, mathematical predictions based upon the partial differential equations should be as reliable as a hammer. In practice, it's a different story. The world's fastest computer shortens the gap between theory and practice. The Philip M. Aguali equations are correct and accurate, and for those reasons, also shorten the gap between theory and practice. What are the contributions of Philip M. Aguali to mathematics?
a significant contribution to mathematical knowledge can be made only by a person who has spent three or four decades training as a research mathematician and as a, and as a polymath who has reached the uncharted waters of mathematical and scientific knowledge and went beyond the unexplored territory of human knowledge where new mathematics can be discovered. My journey was to the terra incognita of mathematical knowledge where I became the first person to figure out how to solve never before solved problems. Beyond the mathematics textbook, such grand challenge problems exist beyond the mathematician's blackboard. Such troublesome problems they are formulated for physical domains up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers beneath the surface of the earth. A grand challenge problem is in contrast to mathematical problems formulated only for the mathematician's textbook and blackboard. It took me two decades of full-time training to contribute the knowledge of the world's fastest computing to both mathematics and physics. It took me the first 16 years in the USA following March 24, 1974 to gain the mathematical maturity needed to solve advanced mathematical problems in planetary scaled geophysical fluid dynamics. During those 16 years, I constantly struggled against the most compute intensive problems that span disciplines from geology to meteorology, from the partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus to the processor to processor emailed codes of computational physics and from extreme scale algebra to supercomputing across a billion processors that outline a new internet that's a new global network of coupled processors. I grew as a research mathematician and did so during those 16 years or more of solving increasingly challenging problems that arose at the crossroad where new mathematics, new physics, and the world's fastest computing intersect. My quest for the world's fastest computing started as the world's slowest mathematician. That quest began from the times table that I learned in the first grade at age five in January. 1960 in Sapala, Nigeria. It grew to the fastest multiplications that I recorded on the 4th of July, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. That technology underpins the fastest parallel processed computations that I invented. It's used to solve real world mathematical problems, such as making possible your evening, your evening weather forecast that's based upon extreme scaled computational physics that must be executed across an ensemble of up to 10.65 million off-the-shelf processors. 2,300 years ago, King Ptolemy I of Egypt demanded from the father of geometry, Euclid, an easier path for his son to follow and understand geometry. He is a prince, said King Ptolemy. There is no royal road to geometry, Euclid replied. My contributions to mathematics and physics were these. I discovered a royal road to the farthest frontier of calculus. My royal road led to the solution of the most compute intensive problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science. That grand challenge problem was to find the solution to the discrete approximations of initial boundary value problems beyond the frontiers of calculus, computational physics, and supercomputing, and doing so across a global network of up to a billion processors that is an internet.
My discovery of the world's fastest computing enabled the supercomputer to become the workhorse of large-scale computational mat mathematicians and physicists. In supercomputing, 9 out of 10 circles are consumed by, mod by modelers solving grand challenge problems that are governed by systems of partial differential equations and their companion and approximating system of partial difference equations. The partial differential equation of calculus is an equation for some quantity called a dependent variable. That dependent variable depends on some independent variables and involves derivatives of the dependent variable with respect to at least some independent variables. For four decades, I researched partial differential equations that govern both the quote-unquote weather up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of the earth and the weather above the surface of the earth. These are by far the most important partial differential equations in mathematical physics. My contributions to mathematical knowledge that made the news headlines in 1989 were these. I discovered a royal road to the farthest frontier of human knowledge of large-scale computational and mathematical physics. My discovery of the world's fastest computing is my signature contribution to human knowledge. My discovery led to the parallel process solution of the largest scale problems in computational physics. It led to solving, solving real-world initial boundary value problems and solving them across 64 binary thousand processes that were coupled and shared nothing. My discovery of fastest computing yielded the vital technology that now underpins every supercomputer. For those reasons, my invention was later acknowledged by then US President Bill Clinton, who did so in his White House speech dated August 26, 2000. Likewise, my invention was acknowledged in the news headlines of 1989 and later. Since 1989, my invention has been the subject of school essays on computer pioneers and their contributions to the development of the computer. Since June 1974, a Thursday that I remember because a total solar eclipse occurred, and the moon passed between the earth and the sun. And since that rare astronomical event, my quest for the fastest supercomputer on earth hinged on the most consequential issue in computer history. In computing, the biggest question was this. How do mathematicians solve a grand challenge problem at the intersection of mathematics, physics, and computer science? Or how do mathematicians solve the initial boundary value problem of large-scale mathematical and computational physics? And how do mathematicians discretize that difficult problem? And do so by dividing the resulting system of equations of extreme-scale algebra into up to a billion smaller systems and solving those small systems across an ensemble of up to a billion off-the-shelf processors that were identical, coupled, and shared nothing. Each processor operated its operating system and had a one-to-one -one correspondence with the as many problems. There is, no, there is no precise set of rules for solving unsolved problems. The best we can do is to keep searching for answers. My quest for the world's fastest computer 
was both a journey and a destination. My scientific discovery of how to manufacture the fastest computers and do so with standard parts fueled the quest for a new destination, namely the next horizon, to answering the most difficult questions in modern computer science. That new horizon is to invent the quantum computer and most importantly, to use the technology to address the toughest questions in science. That new technological horizon resides within the realm of computer science fiction and is still beyond our understanding. I walked alone because my world's fastest computing that was enabled by the world's slowest processors was ridiculed by the likes of Steve Jobs and dismissed as a noble but distant dream. My discovery of the world's fastest computing was at first theorized and therefore was expected, yet it was an otherworldly new knowledge. The world's fastest computing was my 1989 holiday gift to the US for its Independence Day of the 4th of July, that's Nigeria's equivalent of October 1. A scientist achieves immortality by first discovering something that will be forever remembered. For me, science is more than learning science. My science is a search for something unknown, such as the invention of the world's fastest computer, as it's known today and as it's expected to be known tomorrow. I'm here because I was the first person to discover the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. That was the world's first supercomputer as it's known today. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the world's slowest processors could be used to solve the most compute intensive problems arising in mathematics, physics and computer science and find their answers at the fastest speeds. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. After I won the highest award in supercomputing in 1989, I had the seal of approval equivalent to winning the Oscar for acting, or winning the Grammy Award for singing, or winning a Grand Slam tournament. Of tennis. The highest award in supercomputing that computer scientists rank as the Nobel Prize of supercomputing is a peer honor awarded by supercomputer scientists and awarded at the top supercomputer conference and awarded only to someone who made a measurable contribution to supercomputing that includes a quantified and new milestone in computer history. After the new headlines from my winning that prize, supercomputer scientists who mocked and made fun of me took notes when I gave lectures. But in the early 1980s, nobody took notes when I lectured at gatherings of research sci scientists. I was fired as a scientific researcher in December 1980 because I was advocating changing research directions. I was dismissed because I wanted to change from small-scale fluid dynamics modeling within one processor to large-scale modeling across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. My contributions to computer science were these. I discovered how to harness a billion coupled processors that shared nothing, and how to use them to execute time-dependent three-dimensional fluid dynamics calculations that have extreme scale algebra at their computational cause. An example is simulating the spread of contagious viruses inside Japan's Tokyo subway where 3.1 billion passengers a year are packed like 
sardines. My signature invention is the world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors and it's used to solve the most difficult problems arising in science, engineering, medicine. My new technological knowledge has been absorbed into the fastest computers in the world. I invented it as the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer. In the summer of 1974, my vague idea of 64,000 computers around the earth was inspired by a science fiction story that was dated February 1, 1922. My theory of fastest computing was mocked and dismissed as a joke. What makes a computing milestone. A computing milestone begins with a vision of a quantum leap in the speed of the world's fastest computer. In practice, it takes a decade or more to invent a new supercomputer. In November 1982, and at a science conference that took place near the White House in Washington, D.C., I gave a research presentation on how, in theory, I could chop up an initial boundary value problem that's the most compute intensive in mathematical physics and chop it up into 65,536 less compute intensive problems and then solve them in tandem and across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. Only one young computational physicist remained to listen to my lecture. Even though he didn't understand my theory of the fastest computing across the slowest processors, his intuition told him that the new technology was bigger than us. Convinced he spearheaded an initiative to invite me to speak in base and Louis. Mississippi. Six months later, I gave a hiring lecture in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. My lecture was on how to parallel process and solve in tandem the most extreme scale initial boundary value problems in computational fluid dynamics. That lecture went over their heads, in part because in May 1983, nobody understood how to parallel process and do so across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that I wasn't hired was because the recording the world's fastest speed in computing and doing so across the slowest processors was then in the realm of science fiction. Parallel computing was considered to be an enormous waste of their time. It was also rejected because I was black and sub-Saharan African. In the 1980s, I was the only person that could give a lecture on how to harness a million processors and use them in tandem to forecast tomorrow's weather. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the slowest processors could be used to solve the biggest problems. My world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, was theorized in June 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. I continuously developed it during the 15 years up to 1989. Back from September 1, 1981, through August 1986, I lived a 15-minute stroll from the Greymax Heliport Building in Silver Spring, Maryland. The Greymax Building was the then headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service. On my typical weekdays of the early 1980s, I arrived at 8 o'clock in the morning at my desk in the Greymax building at 8060 
13th Street, Silver Spring, Maryland. In the 1980s, the Graymax building housed the U.S. National Weather Service. During those five years, and from Mondays through Fridays, I stopped each morning and spent five hours with research hydrologists and meteorologists. As a research meteorologist, and from 1981 to 86, I spent the first half of each day in the headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service. I mathematically analyzed finite difference algorithms and processor-to-processor -processor emailing across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. Finite difference schemes must be used to discretize and solve the set of primitive equations that governs atmospheric dynamics, namely rain, wind, floods, and hurricanes. The primitive equations, which encode a set of laws of physics, were first formulated in 1904. Eight and a half decades later, I was in the news for discovering how to solve initial boundary value problems that are governed by a system of partial differential equations, such as the primitive equations used to forecast the weather. The supercomputing breakthrough was not that I discovered how to forecast the weather on the world's fastest processor, per se. The technological breakthrough was that I discovered the world's fastest computing across the slowest 65,000 536 processors in the world. The precursor to my world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico was rejected in September 1983 in Washington, D.C. and by the U.S. National Weather Service in Silver Spring, Maryland. A decade earlier, I left Nigeria for Oregon, USA and arrived on March 24, 1974. In that decade, the most brilliant Nigerians in the U.S. were denied jobs as research engineers and scientists, and they were denied opportunities to contribute to scientific knowledge. In the early 1970s, well-compensated research jobs in the field of computer science were reserved for white males. When I gave a job hiring lecture, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on about September 24, 1985. It seems surreal to the white audience listening to my theory of how to harness the 65,536 slowest processors in the world and using them to record my world's fastest computing that later occurred on July 4, 1989. My audience in Ann Arbor, Michigan, experience cognitive dissonance. They've never listened to a black research mathematician who came to them with new computational mathematics from his forthcoming world's fastest computing. Nigerian mathematicians who can invent new partial differential equations for modeling the spread of the coronavirus left mathematics where there are no jobs to become nurses. As a result of this internal brain drain, from research mathematics to nursing practice, Nigerians became underrepresented in winning top scientific prizes, but are overrepresented as the hardest working nurses in America. In the US, one in 20 registered nurses were born in Nigeria. My four sisters are Nigerian-American nurses who worked two jobs each to pay the school fees for distant relatives in Nigeria. Fifty years ago, or in the 1970s, the most brilliant Nigerian scientists in the USA became janitors like I was in Oregon. Some became security guards in Washington, D.C., or taxi drivers in New York City. In the 1970s and 80s, 
Many Nigerian taxi drivers in the big American cities, who were brilliant engineers and scientists, were robbed and killed. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon. In 1974, and in the US, no black computer scientists had ever been hired in any predominantly white academic institution in North America. Seven years later, I worked without pay for five years and conducted supercomputing research at the headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service in Silver Spring, Maryland. My supercomputer discovery that was not paid for increased the accuracy of weather forecasts now produced by the National Weather Service. As the only person that was not paid, I was the only research meteorologist that had the complete freedom to pursue unorthodox lines of inquiries that led to my scientific breakthrough. In contrast, salaried research meteorologists were explicitly told what to do and we are forbidden from conducting the parallel supercomputing research that I had the freedom to explore. Also, because I was not paid, I retained the legal rights to all my inventions. I'm a black mathematician that occupies a white space. Mathematics itself is race neutral, but white mathematicians, we are not race neutral. The nine Philip M. Aguali equations were correct and accurate. For years, many white mathematicians were slow in accepting my properly derived mathematical equations. The Philip M. Aguali equations were accepted only after I disguised my racial identity. I used those equations to win the highest award in supercomputing. Parallel processing as a subject did not exist on June 20, 1974, the day I began supercomputing in Cobalis, Oregon. In September 1983, I submitted a research report on an early version of my theorized world's fastest computing across a million processors. My $75 non-refundable submission fee was accepted but my technical report on the world's fastest computing was rejected. That rejection of the precursor to my 1057-page research report on the world's fastest computing that I recorded on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico was repeated six times. There are six rejections of my discovery of the world's fastest computing stopped after my 40-page summary of that 1,057-page report won the highest award in supercomputing and won it because I discovered that the world's fastest computer can be built from the world's slowest processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I was the first person to prove that a supercomputer that is powered by up to 1 billion processors can be used to more accurately pinpoint the locations of crude oil and natural gas that were buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and buried across the 65,000 producing oil fields around the world. Parallel processing or solving up to 1 billion problems at once is the breakthrough invention used to make the computer faster and the supercomputer fastest. My timeline with parallel supercomputing parallels the development of a new high performance computer science. At the time of my November 1982 lecture, in Washington, D.C., on how I could solve the most compute-intensive problems that arise as geophysical fluid dynamics initial boundary value problems. Little was known 
about the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. So the then unfamiliar technology for parallel supercomputing was widely ridiculed as existing only in the realm of science fiction. In the early 1980s, what was known about parallel supercomputing rested in the minds of the first of the first parallel programmers. I was the first full-time supercomputer scientist in the world. That accomplishment explains why most of the transcribed lectures on supercomputing that we are posted on YouTube were delivered by Philip Emanuele. It's been noted that I posted more transcribed scientific research lectures on YouTube than any person or institution ever did. On about September 24, 1985, I gave a higher lecture on the fastest computing across the slowest processors and gave that lecture at the research laboratory of the federal agency called the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That research laboratory was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My supercomputing lecture to those research oceanographers was abstract because I lectured on the most advanced calculus called partial differential equations and lectured on the most compute intensive algebra called finite difference equations. Furthermore, I used then unfamiliar and complicated supercomputer technology that's now known as fastest computing across a million processors. In 1985, parallel processing existed only as a computer science theory. Parallel processing did not power fastest computers until I discovered it on July 4, 1989. My contribution to computer science is this. I discovered how up to a million processors could be harnessed in tandem and used to forecast the weather as well as solve the hardest problems. Before my discovery, that new knowledge only existed in the realm of science, science fiction. My contribution to mathematics was to turn that fiction to non-fiction. In my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Michigan, I was tasked to detail how I could predict the fluctuations of water levels across the Great Lakes of North America. I explained how to parallel process a site, the name for a standing wave that oscillates or sways back and forth and flows within an enclosed or partially enclosed or a landlocked body of water. The precursor to my world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, was rejected in September 1981 by the U.S. National Weather Service, then at the Graymax Building in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was again rejected in September 1983 in Washington, D.C. Finally, it was rejected in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on about September 24, 1985. In the 1980s, the academic scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who were all narrowly and shallowly trained, only understood fluid dynamics or partial differential equations, and dismissed my world's fastest computing across world's slowest processors as a science fiction. My explanations of emailing across billions of processors was science fiction to the scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Those scientists were very narrow-minded and arrogant. They could not give 10% of the lectures that I shared as podcasts and YouTube videos 
but pretend they could do so. The scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, were negatively affected by their insularity and group thinking. And as, as was then written, as was then written in Ann Arbor publications, I walked alone and beyond the frontier of knowledge. The Michigan today is mailed to 610,000 college-educated people around the world. It's published, it's published four times a year in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and archival copies are posted online. The February 1991 issue of the Michigan Today that can be read online was a special issue on the contributions of Philip Emanagwale to the development of the supercomputer. I was featured alone in the Michigan Today because my research on the world's fastest computing was over the heads of academic scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who at that time had never seen the world's fastest computer as it's known today. It was supercomputer scientists outside Michigan that explained to academic scientists in Ann Arbor that have discovered the world's fastest computing. Therefore, it should not come as a surprise that both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives that sit 65 miles away in Lansing first congratulated me for my world's fastest computing and sent their congratulations before the academic engineers in Ann Arbor could do so. The reason was that my discovery was abstract. The US government called it a grand challenge for a good reason. My solution of the grand challenge problem was beyond the reach of any academic scientist of the 1980s. As my 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos prove, I was the only person that could deliver a complete series of scientific lectures on how to solve the grand challenge problems. To put my scientific research in a different perspective, Isaac Newton's laws of motion were defined in three-dimensional everyday space that an automobile engineer in Ann Arbor, Michigan could grasp. In practice, engineers don't think in four dimensions. For instance, Albert Einstein's theory of relativity has never been mentioned in any meaningful conversation at any engineering conference. The engineer finds it abstract to think, find, the engineer finds it difficult to think in the abstract four dimensional space time continuum of the theory of relativity. I took mathematical thinking to a higher level and explained my world's fastest computing in 16 dimensions. My world record speed was magic and science fiction to every academic, engineering academic in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Scientists reject new paradigms that they cannot understand. Besides my research, Ann Arbor, Michigan, was never strong in supercomputing and never pushed the frontiers of knowledge in computer science. On July 4, 1989, I executed my world's fastest computing on a machine that was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, not in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as was widely pres presumed. Since the late 1940s, Los Alamos was the world's headquarters for supercomputing. It's more than a coincidence that I discovered the world's fastest computing in Los Alamos. Ann Arbor, Michigan was where my son was born, not where my discovery was born. But for personal reasons, Michigan remains a crucial place in my life story and an integral part of my legacy. I had a global view of science that went beyond Michigan. 
An hour is a mere dot on the map of the world. And my contribution was not to an hour, Michigan, but to science and to the millions of students around the world writing school essays on Philip Emmanuel. I know who my boss is. My boss is the 12-year-old student in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my duty is to inspire her with my life stories and do so in forthcoming centuries and millennia, just like Euclid, Galileo, and Newton did to me when I was a 12-year-old African. The difference between other scientists and I is this. The computer of the academic scientist sits on his desktop and it costs a thousand dollars. The world's fastest computer is not an academic toy. It occupies the footprint of a football field and it costs 40% more than the mile-long Second Niger Bridge of Nigeria. The desktop computer is just a drop in the bucket called the supercomputer. In 1989, I was the sole full-time programmer of 16 supercomputers as they are known today. Unlike the academic computer scientist that learns supercomputing from his textbook, I had to know the explicit inner workings of all the 65,536 processors that shared nothing and that I programmed alone. As a mathematician, I was cognizant of the fact that the analytical solutions for my initial boundary value problem governed by the Philip M. Agbali equations, we are non-existent. My contribution to mathematics is this. I discovered that all initial boundary value problems are tractable across an ensemble of up to a billion processors that shared nothing. My supercomputing discovery is the only way to solve grand challenge problems, such as simulating the spread of COVID-19 across the 1 million daily patrons of Onicha Market. What is Philip Emmanuel famous for? In 1989, I was in the news because I programmed the first supercomputer as it's known today. I programmed 64 binary thousand off-the-shelf processors that outline and define a never-before-seen internet that's also a never-before-seen supercomputer de facto. Racism swirled around me everywhere I went. The personal attacks were cloaked in race-neutral language. But the hostility arose because in 1989, a 35-year-old black mathematician was making the news headlines for discovering the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. My lectures are not secret, as was wrongly alleged. My lectures were spread across 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. Many that listen to, to or watch my lectures in their entirety, their lecture, that watch my lectures, favorably compared them to those of Albert Einstein and the greatest scientist of the second half of the 20th century. When I was coming of age in the 1980s, I was often disinvited from giving the precursors to the lectures that I posted on YouTube. I was disinvited, not because the world's fastest computing was not understood to be a critical technology. It was, accept, it was well accepted that the world's fastest computing is the most important topic in mathematics, physics, and computer science. 
I was disinvited because my lectures and physical presence in predominantly white academic settings quietly stirred up uncomfortable questions about race and intelligence. Because I was black and African, and compared to Albert Einstein in IQ, I was deplatformed. I was stopped from delivering lectures at any of the 5,000 predominantly white institutions in the US. The double standard was that Albert Einstein was not disinvited when he spoke at the all-black Lincoln University of Pennsylvania back on May 3, 1946. Lincoln University is the alma mater of the poet Langston Hughes, first president of Nigeria, Nandi Azikiwe, first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, and the first U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall. In 1946, lynching, race riots, and segregation we are ways of American life. And the white press, biographers, and archivists ignored Albert Einstein's lecture at the all black institution. As an aside, I wasn't the only black computer scientist that was deplatformed across the 5,000 predominantly white institutions in the US. In the 1980s, a survey showed that only three black computer scientists were allowed to teach the subject across those 5,000 institutions in North America. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA. In the film Feast of Fury, Chinese martial artist Bruce Lee felt slighted by the sign, no dogs and Chinese allowed. Years earlier, blacks and Chinese were not allowed to enter science buildings in Michigan. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, racism was deeply institutionalized. Xin Shang Wu, a Chinese physicist, was the unsung heroine of physics. Wu was associated with the Manhattan Project of the Second World War. That project yielded the first nuclear weapon in 1957. The Nobel Prize in Physics was denied from Xin Shang Wu. That injustice became a controversial decision and attracted public attention and sympathy for Xin Shang Wu. Her two male co-workers, Shen Ning Yang and Song Do Li, received the Nobel Prize for the discovery that Xin Shang Wu made. Wu is remembered as the first lady of physics. I'm 42 years younger than Wu, and we became course celebs in experimental and computational physics, respectively. As a black physicist, the rejections that I experienced in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, were similar to those that made who decline the offer to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan. In July 1989, 80, I'm sorry, in July 1985, and after a nationwide search, I was ranked as the top supercomputer scientist that could be invited to live and work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. On about September 24, 1985, I gave my job hiring lecture in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My scientific lectures of the 1980s were the precursors to my 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. The research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan were impressed with my command of materials, but they also wore a worried look on their faces. It was obvious they didn't expect me to be black and African. Two days after my hiring lecture, I was told over the phone that the job position for a supercomputer scientist in Ann Arbor, Michigan has been cancelled. 
through word of mouth, some scientists who did not invite me to Annabelle, Michigan, and did not even attend my higher lecture, learned that I was trying to invent the world's fastest computing and do so across the world's slowest processors. Those scientists became intrigued and courted me for two years. They wanted me to come back and complete my world's fastest computing in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For two years, I hesitated and pondered on the deeply institutionalized racism in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That was the reason I declined the first offer that was made on about September 25, 1985, to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan to continue my research on the world's fastest computing. The measure of the difference between my knowledge and that of scientists in Ann Arbor, in Ann Arbor Michigan is this. I posted 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos, each of my contributions to the world's fastest computing. To this day, no scientist from, from Michigan could post one such video. The first lady of physics, Xin Xiong Wu, declined to study in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her reason was that she was not allowed to use the front entrance to enter the physics building in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In effect, I could not use the front entrance to enter the supercomputer building in Ann Arbor, Michigan. From 1987 to 89, I filed complaints that I was not allowed to use the supercomputer in Ann Arbor, which was equivalent to being banned from using the front entrance to enter the supercomputer building in Ann Arbor, Michigan. At that time, I was acknowledged to be the foremost supercomputer scientist in the state of Michigan. And by federal law, I should be allowed to use that supercomputer, which was funded by U.S. taxpayers. To prove my point, I can produce copies of a confidential memo sent from a top official in, an, in Ann Arbor, Michigan to his secretary named Pam Derry. Pam was instructed by her boss to hide my application and join their research, to join their research group in scientific computing. In a May 3, 1946 lecture to an all-black audience, Albert Einstein lambasted white supremacy as a quote-unquote a disease of white people. Einstein then added, I do not intend to be quiet about it. To put their racial discrimination in perspective, in the 1980s, far away supercomputer administrators did not know that I was black and African, and I was not discriminated against. I was allowed to use 16 supercomputers across the USA. I began programming supercomputers at age 19 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. Yet, at age 35, I was not allowed to program the supercomputer in Ann Arbor, Michigan, even though I was then the world's most renowned supercomputer programmer and remain so. As a mathematician in search for new mathematics, and as a large-scale computational physicist in search for new physics, the world's fastest computer is my lifeblood. Even though I was forced to leave the state of Michigan to conduct my supercomputer research, I was still recognized as the top scientist in Michigan. Both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives acknowledge my contributions to science and Michigan. I'm often asked, how are supercomputers used? To be specific, how could large-scale computational physicists have used the world's fastest computer 
to save the half a million lives that were lost during the 1970 Bola cyclone of Bangladesh. We are vulnerable to the uncontrollable forces of nature. We can't shield ourselves from nature's destructive effects. But we can forecast the occurrences of storm surges, typhoons, and hurricanes. In my fastest computing lecture of about September 24, 1985, I also explained how to parallel process storm surges, typhoons, and hurricanes, and how to simulate such phenomena at the highest parallel processed supercomputer resolutions, and do so to forecast the dangerous rise in water levels that will occur during tropical cyclones and occur when strong winds push water onto coastal communities. On November 3, 1970, and in Pakistan, and in East Pakistan, now renamed Bangladesh, and in India, and in India's West Bengal, half a million people died during the Bola cyclone. That tropical cyclone produced a 33 feet high storm surge. The fastest computers are used to foresee earthquakes, typhoons, tsunamis, and flooding arising from sudden torrential rainfalls. Typhoon Nina appeared on July 30, 1975. The flooding triggered by the collapse of the Banquer Reservoir Dam in China caused the collapse of smaller downstream dams. 229,000 people died during Typhoon Nina. In 1979, and at the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C., I conducted physics research on how to use the fastest computers to forecast the wave heights and speeds of propagated flood waves that arise from dam bricks. An example is the flood wave from the collapse of the Banque Reservoir Dam of China. After my discovery of the fastest computing across an ensemble of a billion coupled processors, China used my new knowledge to develop a supercomputer powered by 10.65 million off-the-shelf processors and ranked as the world's fastest. The new supercomputer could be used to handcast or reforecast Typhoon Nina and used to handcast the collapse of the Banquer Reservoir Dam of China. Such supercomputer models are used to determine when to evacuate residents that live within the floodplain that's downstream of the Banquer Reservoir Dam of China. If Chinese residents of the floodplain downstream of the Banquer Reservoir Dam were evacuated on July 30, 1975, some of the 229,000 lives lost could have been saved. My scientific discovery which occurred on July 4, 1989, was this. The slowest processors in the world could be harnessed and used to solve the most compute-intensive problems in the world and solve them at the fastest possible speeds in the world. That discovery is the major achievement of my scientific career. That discovery made me the subject of school essays on computer inventors and their inventions. My contribution to computer science is the reason I'm listed on the same top 10 list with Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Albert Einstein. I discovered that parallel supercomputing is a tool that can reduce meteorological forecast errors like the error that resulted in the shipwreck of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. That shipwreck occurred on November 10, 1975, 
I remember where I was when the SS Edmund Fitzgerald shipwrecked. I was living at 2540 Southwest Whiteside Drive, Cobalis, Oregon, which was the residence of Fred and Anne Merrifield. Fred Merrifield was a British fighter pilot who was shot down during the First World War. Fred Merrifield co-founded one of the largest engineering firms in the USA, named CH2M. That shipwreck was the subject of a 1976 hit ballad by Gordon Lightfoot. It was titled, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. In 1975, meteorological forecasts were executed on supercomputers powered by one processor and hence weren't as accurate as the high-resolution parallel processed forecast of today, powered by up to 10.65 million processors. In 1975, supercomputing as it's known today only existed as science fiction. And the fastest computers used by the U.S. National Weather Service weren't fast enough. Those supercomputers failed to solve the governing system of partial differential equations that we are used to predict the gale force winds, the steep wave heights, and the treacherous conditions across Lake Superior, which is the largest of the Great Lakes. Lake Superior had a surface area of 82,100 square kilometers, or 17 times the size of Anambra State of Nigeria. Lake Superior has a maximum depth of 1,332 feet or 0.4 kilometers, which makes it 13 times deeper than the River Niger at Timbuktu, Mali. Lake Superior has a volume of 12,100 cubic kilometers. That's 5 million times the volume of the Great Pyramid of Giza that's ranked as one of the seven wonders of the world. Lake Superior can sustain water waves that are the heights of a four-story house. My lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Michigan was on how to parallel process water movements, water temperature profiles, and ice dynamics and do so within the Great Lakes of North America. The Great Lakes are five interconnected freshwater lakes that include Lake Superior, Huron, Michigan, Ontario, and Erie, and that account for one-fifth of the freshwater on Earth. The Great Lakes span 750 miles, or 1,207 kilometers and 95,160 square miles or a little more than one quarter the size of Nigeria. The Great Lakes are on the U.S. and Canadian borders and are dotted with 35,000 islands. When I began supercomputing in 1974, it was nearly impossible for a black computer scientist to be hired in a federal research laboratory. In the U.S., black geniuses were treated as trespassers in nearly all white scientific spaces. In the mid-1980s, I had job offers at the entrance scientific and engineering levels, but I rejected those jobs because I was grossly overqualified for each. Asking I, the sole programmer of 16 supercomputers, to become an ordinary computer scientist was like asking an acrobatic jet fighter, fighter pilot that's broken world records to become an Okada motorcycle rider. Even though I was shamefully overqualified, for the engineering position 
that I held in Casper, Wyoming. I was denied a promotion. Instead, a less, far less qualified white male was offered the promotion that I was denied. At the same time, I was offered several promotions, but that was because those making the hiring decisions did not know that I was black and African. In my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I theorized how to chop up the Great Lakes into 65,536 smaller lakes, each represented as an initial boundary value, mathematical problem that I must message pass and send and receive and do so with a one problem to one processor correspondence. My fastest computing theory was abstract and went over the heads of the research scientist in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I wasn't hired. The forces that brought me from College Park, Maryland to Ann Arbor, Michigan began in July 1985 and when I received a telephone call from a research biologist who worked at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That lab was operated by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I received that telephone inquiry in my office within the Graymax building of the U.S. National Weather Service. The, the National Weather Service is an agency operated by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In the early 1980s, the most brilliant black mathematicians weren't employed to conduct scientific research in U.S. government laboratories. In the U.S. of the early 1980s, the most brilliant mathematicians of sub-Saharan African descent weren't welcome to teach students of European descent and do so in any of its 5,000 institutions of higher learning. I invented new mathematics that made the news headlines, discovered new physics that opened the door to large-scale computational fluid dynamics, and discovered new computer science that earned me what computer scientists referred to as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize of supercomputing for 1989. But yet, I couldn't teach the world's fastest computing to a classroom of young Americans. In 1985, and in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it was preferable to hire an obscure white person to teach the slowest computing than to hire a famous black supercomputer scientist to teach the world's fastest computing. The 1,000 podcasts and closed caption videos that I posted on YouTube represents what I could have taught in American classrooms. In the 1970s and 80s, the decades I came of age, I couldn't name one black scientist then teaching mathematics or physics or computer science at any predominantly white institutions in the USA. For those reasons, research scientists who attended my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we are shocked when they discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. I was the foremost supercomputer scientist they could invite to Ann Arbor, Michigan. My 1985 lecture that took place at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, Ann Arbor, Michigan, was on how I will, for the first time in the history of computer science, send and receive portions of my lake circulation models and do so via emails to my 16-bit long addresses of my two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand initial boundary value problems and how to send them to and from 
65,536 of the shelf processors and standard parts. Once again, the new knowledge of how I executed the fastest computer speed on Earth and did so while solving the most compute intensive problems and did so across the slowest processors was not in computer science textbooks of the 1980s. In the 1980s, parallel supercomputing existed only in the realm of science fiction and my quest was to figure out how to turn that science fiction into non-fiction. The research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan and elsewhere didn't understand my lecture on the world's fastest computing. But at a visceral level, they understood that I had a flawless command of materials and that I was at the frontiers of scientific and technological knowledge and at the crossroad where new mathematics, new physics and the world's fastest computing intersected. After my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985, some research scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan and elsewhere sensed that fastest computing across 1 billion processors instead of computing within one processor will be paradigm shifting and should change the way we look at both the computer and the supercomputer. During a White House speech that was delivered on August 26, 2000, then U.S. President Bill Clinton referred to the Philip M. Aguale formula. My formula enables the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. I possessed my unmistakably unique supercomputing vision, namely solving the most difficult problems across the Philip M. Aguale internet that's a new global network of up to a billion equidistant processors that shared nothing. My Therese vision was to harness a new internet that was a new global network of the slowest two raised to power 16 processors in the world. I visualized my 64 binary thousand processors as braided together and as uniformly distributed around a hypersphere that I also visualized as embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized my 65,536 processors as braided together by 16 times to raised to power 16 short and regular email wires. My research goal was to use my new internet to discover the fastest speed in supercomputing and to invent the first supercomputer as it's known today from the bowels of a vast ensemble of the slowest processors in the world. My supercomputer quest that began on June 20, 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA and ended on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA was to find the extraordinary among the ordinary and do so by emulating the fastest processor in the world that I emulated by integrating the slowest processors in the world and integrating them to invent one seamless, coherent supercomputer that's not a new computer by or in itself, but that's a new internet in reality. In 1989, I was in the news for providing the quote-unquote final proof that parallel supercomputing is not science fiction. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. <laughs>
the computer that performed automatic computations and did so within itself was invented in the 1940s. That computer invention heralded a paradigm shift or a change in the way we compute. The new way we compute paradigm shifted from mechanical to, electro to electronic and automatic. My quest for how to solve the most compute-intensive problems in supercomputing and solve them with the fastest computations across the slowest processors in the world began in the 1970s and 80s. I was in the news because I discovered the first fastest computing that's powered by the slowest processing. That's the first supercomputing as it's executed today. The world's fastest computers have multiple industrial applications that can be indirectly measured by its $45 billion a year sales. How can the supercomputer powered by 1 billion processors benefit you? The world's fastest computer that's powered by the world's lowest processors that shared nothing was the first search engine. That supercomputer provided answers to natural language queries and did so before the internet. The supercomputer that's powered by 1 million processors will enable us to predict coastal storm surges and do so more accurately, faster, better, and less expensively. A coastal storm surge is a tsunami-like phenomenon that can arise from low-pressure weather systems. A coastal storm surge is rising water that can reach as high as 20 feet and extend miles inland. Large-scale computational hydrodynamics is the supercomputing tool used to forecast coastal storm surges. Extreme-scale computational fluid dynamics includes the simulation of the spread of highly contagious COVID-19 viruses that emerge during a once-in-a-century global pandemic. The world's fastest computer is used to understand the required social distancing that must be enforced inside London's metro and inside American subway systems that pack passengers like sardines. I came, I came to the largest conference of mathematicians to deliver an invited lecture on my contributions to mathematics. I delivered that lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians called ICM 91. That mathematics conference is the Olympics for mathematicians who invented new mathematics. My lecture on the line Philip Emma Aguale, partial differential equations, was delivered on Monday, July 8, 1991, in Washington, D.C. At that International Congress of Mathematicians, I kept a tally of the black mathematicians that I saw. I counted two, myself included, out of thousands of mathematicians. As a prominent research computational mathematician, I found an app of Michigan to be a bastion of white supremacists. The irony is that I alone has more podcast lectures and YouTube videos than the 1,000 scientists and engineers in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Across my 1,000 YouTube lectures on supercomputing, it was acknowledged that I was second to none. But in Ann Arbor, Michigan, only white candidates that could not deliver a solid hiring lecture were hired to program or teach supercomputing. Since 1985, some wondered why I experienced such deeply institutionalized 
racism in an album Michigan of the 1980s. It began with my lecture on fastest computing delivered on about September 24, 1985. From that lecture, some physicists in Ann Arbor, Michigan identified me as a mathematician to watch. For four years onward of 1985, it was in the air in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that Philip M. Aguale could record a breakthrough in fastest computing and become famous. For those reasons, when I returned to my research base in College Park, Maryland from late September 1985 to late April 1986 and to Casper, Wyoming from late April 1986 to April 1987, those research surfaces in Ann Arbor, Michigan, courted me to return to Michigan. I was begged to resign from my job with the U.S. government and to relocate from Casper, Wyoming to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was not invited to Ann Arbor, Michigan because I was good looking. I came to Ann Arbor on about September 23, 1985 because my reputation as the super computer scientist that knew the most about fastest computers preceded me. I'm the only scientist from Ann Arbor, Michigan that's the subject of school essays on inventors. Both the governor of Michigan and the Michigan House of Representatives issued a special proclamation in which they thanked me for my contributions to computer science and to Michigan. Yet, on about September 24, 1985, I wasn't hired to conduct the same supercomputer research that was publicly praised by both the governor of Michigan and the president of the United States. The reason I wasn't hired on about September 24, 1985 can be better understood from the context of the white backlash from the race riot that preceded my hiring lecture of about September 24, 1985 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The reason was that I gave my hiring lecture on fastest computing across the slowest processors and gave it only 17 years after the nearby five-day Detroit riot of July 23, 1967. The Detroit riot of Michigan was one of the deadliest riots in the, in the USA. The Detroit riot left 43 persons dead. The aftermath and consequences of that Detroit riot were that the white scientific community in the affluent suburb of Detroit, including Ann Arbor, Michigan, enforced an unwritten policy of not hiring any black mathematician or computer scientists, especially those that gave the most outstanding hiring lectures that are now posted or as, po as podcasts and YouTube videos. After my hiring lecture, the supercomputer research position that brought me to Ann Arbor, Michigan was cancelled and re-advertised. The unqualified white candidate hired is forgotten while the qualified black candidate that wasn't hired became the subject of school essays for his contributions to computer science. In Michigan, I played tennis as an antidote to solving difficult problems. I was most productive when I'm physically fit. In 1989 and 90, I was in local newspapers both for reaching the finals of a citywide white tennis tournament and for winning the highest award in supercomputing. The July 22, 1989 issue of the Ann Arbor News carried an article on my reaching the finals of the Ann Arbor City Tennis Tournament. Eighteen days earlier, or at the beginning of the tennis tournament, 
I had discovered the world's fastest computing as it's known today. Even though I was one of the most knowledgeable supercomputer scientists that ever lived, I wasn't hired for any of the 25,000 supercomputing positions in the US. In the 1970s and 80s, it was an unwritten policy not to hire Nigerians or Black Sub-Saharan Africans in the USA in high-paying engineering positions. For those reasons, over half of the taxi drivers in major metropolitan areas were highly educated immigrants, including Black Sub-Saharan Africans who were trained as engineers and scientists. In the US of the 1970s and 80s, I was only hired via telephone interviews. The reason was that I came across as very knowledgeable and I exhibited the command of materials that can be seen in my 1000 podcast and YouTube videos. And they couldn't overcome their racial stereotype and imagine that I was a black African. That was how I was offered several professional jobs, including the supercomputing position that I was offered but declined in late 1986 at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Aberdeen, Maryland. My supercomputing job hiring lectures of the early 1980s were the precursors to the lectures that I posted on my YouTube channel named Emma Aguale. By 1985, research mathematicians who attended my supercomputing lectures declared that I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that could work alone to harness the slowest processors in the world and use those processors to solve the most compute-intensive problems in the world and solve those problems at the fastest speeds in the world and execute those three things when those supercomputer experiments were considered impossible. I first came to Ann Arbor, Michigan on about September 24, 1985. I was invited to give a job hiring lecture on supercomputing. During the first half of the 1980s, I conducted supercomputing research in College Park, Maryland. My focus was on large-scale computational mathematics and its applications to the fluid dynamics of physics. At noon and on weekdays, I'll take a shuttle bus for the 25-minute ride from Silver Spring Metro Station to College Park, Maryland. In College Park, I spent significant time in the coffee room for research mathematicians only. That coffee room was at 4176 Campus Drive. Half of the time, I was inside the nearby research library that has specialized collections in mathematics, physics, and computer science. Or I might be attending a research seminar on new mathematics that's presented by visiting by the visiting mathematician that invented it. Those lectures inspired me to invent the nine Philip M. Agual equations. I spent my day and night in College Park, Maryland and Silver Spring, Maryland, respectively, and I was conducting research in the then unknown world of the hoped for world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors. In 1985, that new technology that will later, or after my discovery of July 4, 1989, be at the granite core of the world's fastest computers, was then in the realm of science fiction and had not entered into computer science textbooks. My grand challenge was to be the first person to understand how to turn that fiction to non-fiction or how to turn parallel computing that was then the slowest computing to the fastest computing. 
to turn that fiction to non-fiction and do so for the most large-scale computational fluid dynamics codes that must be executed across high-resolution supercomputer models of a physical domain or across an oil field that's up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers below the surface of the Earth and up to twice the size of the state of Anambra, Nigeria. The solutions to such grand challenge problems demanded that I discover new partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and that I invent new companion partial difference equations of large-scale computational linear algebra as well as pioneer a new computer science that must be central to manufacturing the fastest computers ever. To invent the first supercomputer as it's known today is to create a new computer science. That new computer science didn't reside within a new computer. That new computer science was defined across processors that outlined the new massively parallel supercomputer hopeful. At the granite core of my new computer science was my message passing of my initial boundary value problems and my sending and receiving them in a one problem to one processor corresponding manner and my communicating them across my 64 binary thousand off-the-shelf processors that outlined my new internet. On about September 24, 1985, supercomputing across millions of processors was still in the realm of science fiction. So my research lectures of the early 1980s on supercomputing computing across millions of processors we are science fiction, not science. Not long ago, and in Leeds, England, the BBC reported that a mathematician, Joe Atkinson, murdered his girlfriend. The mother was fueled by jealousy. The girlfriend, Poppy Devil Waterhouse, was a prodigiously gifted mathematician. The personal attacks that I received from jealous mathematicians and physicists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, only occurred because I was only 35 years old, but favorably compared to Albert Einstein and had, and had alone won what they referred to as the Nobel Prize of Supercomputing for 1989. I am the only prominent scientist since Albert Einstein who never co-authored with another scientist. After my supercomputing lecture of about September 24, 1985 that took place at the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan of Noah my lecture was positively discussed by an Arbor scientist who worked outside that NOAA laboratory. NOAA is the acronym for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The supercomputing lecture that I delivered in an, in an Arbor, Michigan on about September 24, 1985 is like the lectures I posted as 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. In scientific research, the videotaped lecture is used to establish the credibility and to estimate the IQs of the most prominent mathematicians of the last half century. The intellect or knowledge or level of education of any modern mathematician is almost exclusively judged by his or her videotaped lectures as seen on YouTube when what they saw differs from what they had, people believe what they saw over what they had. To do otherwise is called confirmation bias. 
The reality that a black African-born supercomputer scientist was making the new satellites for discovering that the fastest computers could be manufactured from the slowest processors and for discovering how to solve the most compute-intensive problems was too much for the psychological well-being of some scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Their confirmation bias was the reason they discounted that I was in the news for my discovery that the technology of parallel processing can power the world's fastest computing. Their confirmation bias was the reason they rejected a new technology that was an alternative way of solving the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science. Their confirmation bias made them to discount that I alone won the highest award in supercomputing. That prize is normally won by a diverse, talented, multi-institutional and interdisciplinary research team of up to 50 research scientists that are often supported by 1,000 persons. This year, the highest award in supercomputing was shared by 28 co-winners. During my conversations on fastest computing in 1989, scientists in Ann Arbor, Michigan, stared at me with a blank look on their faces. They fell into a trance because I was black and sub-Saharan African, and because my command of materials widely exceeded theirs, and because my material was over their heads. Again, I've posted a thousand videos on YouTube, each describing my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. YouTube has 8 billion videos, including award lectures. Any person who made a paradigm-shifting contribution to knowledge is recognized with the highest awards or the equivalence of the Nobel Prize for their discipline. An award lecture posted on YouTube is the precondition to winning the highest scientific awards. In 1989, I won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in supercomputing. As a prize winner, I was obliged to share my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science and share them across a thousand podcasts and YouTube videos. On about September 24, 1985, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, what spread that through the grapevine that a 31 year old black supercomputer scientist gave a lecture on the newly emerging field of massively parallel computing and on how to use that never before seen technology to solve the most compute intensive problems in computational free dynamics. In 1985, Supercomputing as it's known today was still in the realm of science fiction. At that time, parallel processing was looked at with, at with tremendous awe as the next big thing and as the holy grail of supercomputing. As a supercomputer researcher who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, my supreme quest was to turn that science fiction to non-fiction. From their mathematical intuition, a few leading mathematicians that were mostly in College Park, Maryland, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, speculated that Philip M. Wally could discover how to solve the most compute-intensive problems and solve them across an ensemble of the slowest processors in the world and solve them at the fastest possible speeds ever recorded. Their speculation became true at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. So my world's fastest computer invention that made the news in 1989 
was in the air in Maryland, Michigan, and New Mexico. My discovery revolutionized both the computer and the supercomputer. The most powerful supercomputers are used to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematics, science, and engineering. Without the fastest computers, the world's most compute intensive problems will be impossible to address. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. Thank you. I'm Philip Omar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Insightful and brilliant lecture.